Hey, what's going on guys? This is Rob Willis.info here and uh, this is a video I've been wanting to do for a little while now and I'm actually pretty excited about this one. Um, but today we're going to be talking about using Windows Server 2012 R2 for uh, shared storage with Microsoft Failover Clustering. Now typically when you get involved with Microsoft Failover Clustering you're going to need some sort of high-end uh, storage solution like a SAN or a DAS so that way you can use as your shared storage between the nodes. Uh, but in this case we're going to be able to get around that completely by using a uh, third window server and share out storage from it via iSCSI. Alright, so this next slide is basically an overview of how I set the lab up for this one. But uh, you'll notice I have three server 2012 R2 VMs running, all set up very similarly. Uh, three vCPUs, three gig of RAM, and uh, the storage server does have two NICs in it, and that comes into play later on when we start setting up the uh, MPIO stuff. So the general idea here is by running the iSCSI target server role on our storage server, or store one in this case, we can then share out drive space via iSCSI to both nodes that are going to be involved in our cluster, which in this case is going to be our test DBO1 and our TDBO2. So once the storage has been configured, we can then use the iSCSI initiator along with the MPIO feature to connect our nodes to the storage that's presented from our store one server, and then, and then we can use that storage for our Microsoft failover cluster. So because the storage is shared between the nodes, each node will actually be able to write to it and access the disk. But if they both tried to write to the disk at the same time, they would corrupt the disk. So what happens is the cluster, or the Microsoft failover cluster, actually handles which disk actively has the disk at the time. So it does get presented to both nodes at the same time, but it will actually only be online on one of the nodes at a time. And one other note about this setup is, while a domain controller is not required for the storage itself and sharing it out to the nodes, a domain controller is required for the failover cluster portion of this. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is set up the storage server. And um, you'll notice that the storage server does have two uh, physical network adapters, or virtual in this case, and then one IP address assigned to each of those. And that becomes important later on when we get into the multipath I.O. portion. And uh, the only other special thing about this is it does have two data drives, and the uh, second data drive is the one we're going to use for our iSCSI drives. Alright, so the first thing you're going to want to do is open up Server Manager and go to Manage, Add Roles and Features, and then go ahead and click Next on that first screen there. We're going to go to Next, make sure the right server is selected, Next, and here we're going to go to File and Storage Services, Expand File and iSCSI Services, and we want to locate the iSCSI Target Server role. We want to make sure it's checked, and then we're going to hit next, and hit next again, and then go ahead and click install. Now it's going to take a few moments to install, so we're going to go ahead and skip through a little bit of this here, so it's going to look like it goes really quick. Alright, so now that that has installed successfully, uh, we can go ahead and close this window and begin configuring our iSCSI drives. So to configure the newly installed iSCSI server role, on the left hand side in server manager, we're going to go to file and stored services and then we're going to select iSCSI on the left hand menu. And then once we get to that screen you'll notice in the center pane it says to create an iSCSI virtual disk start the new iSCSI virtual disk wizard and then we're going to click there to start the wizard. You notice the first screen we see ask, actually asks us where we want to store the volume so we're going to select the E drive here in our case and then I'm going to click on next. And then the next screen asks us to name the volume since I'm going to be building a cluster here my first disk is going to be my quorum and I notice that it does show the path that it's going to store the volume on and it actually is just a .vhdx file. Uh, the next, next screen is actually going to ask us how big we want the drive to be. And I'm just going to do one gig in this case, but uh, notice that there are options for fixed size, uh, dynamically expanding, and differencing. We're just going to go with the fixed size in this case, leaving the default to uh, clear the disk on uh, allocation. On this next screen is going to ask what we want to use as our iSCSI target, and since we don't have one, we're just going to go ahead and create a new one. And uh, for our name, we're just going to go ahead and name it default-target and click next. Now on the next screen for the access servers, this is basically going to be who we want to allow to access this target server, which in our case is going to be our test DBO1 and our test DBO2. So we're just going to enter the value for the selected type and do IP address. And I'm going to enter the IP address of the DBO1 and the DBO2 servers here. and I'm just going to repeat the steps for the second server, enter the IP address in, click OK, and hit Next. Alright, so here we have options to enable um, authentication. We can do CHAP and reverse CHAP. In my case, since this is going to be a lab environment, I'm just going to leave those off. 
And then on the final page here, it's going to show us our, um, basically all the settings we picked to review and then go ahead and create the storage. And once you click create, it'll take a few moments to go ahead and provision the storage for us. So I'm going to go ahead and speed this portion up a little bit here for time's sake. All right, so now that that's completed, we're going to go ahead and click close on there. And then uh, we can go ahead and provision our additional disks here. In this case, I'm going to do three, a uh, Quorum drive, a DB log files, and a DB files drive. So we're going to do the same steps as before. Click the E drive, and then in this case, this is going to be my DB dash files drive. Go ahead and click next. And uh, I'm going to do five gigs for this one. Uh, same thing, fixed disk with the uh, clear the virtual disk on allocation. And uh, since we already created the target, I can just use the same target that I used on the last one, the default target. And uh, then just go ahead and provision the disk. So you notice with this disk that it's a little bit bigger and the status column it shows clearing and it's going to take a little bit longer since it was like 5 gig or so. But uh, while it's doing that we can go ahead and provision our third and final disk for this set. So the steps for the third disk are going to be exactly the same as the previous two. This one's going to be my DB logs. I'm going to make it 5 gigs also, attach it to the same existing iSCSI target, and then go ahead and create that disk. All right, so that's really all there is to configuring the storage server portion of this. Um, it's going to go ahead and continue uh, like provisioning and clearing out the space for these disks, but um, it's just going to take a few more moments for that, but nothing we really need to watch. So while it's doing that, we can go ahead and configure our uh, client nodes, which is going to be our DB01 and our DB02 servers to access this storage. All right, so now it's time to configure one of our nodes to access the storage that we just provisioned. So you notice here that I'm on the uh, TDB01 server, and uh, there's really nothing special about this node other than the fact that it is a member of a Microsoft failover cluster. Um, you see I have the manager open here, and it's a member of the TCLUS1. And uh, other than that, it's really nothing special. Um, you see there's no roles installed. Um, there's actually no storage on this either. Um, it basically is just a blank cluster with two nodes added to it, or a DB01 and our DB02 servers. And, um, and like I said, see there's no storage added into it here. But the storage we're connecting to, we will be adding into this cluster here. So to begin configuring this client, the first thing we want to do is open up Server Manager and go up to Manage, Add Roles and Features, we're going to click next on this first screen here. We're going to click next here. Make sure we pick the right server. We're going to do the DB01. Click next. All right, and we're going to skip the roles because we're not actually installing any roles here. And click next. And then we're going to scroll down on the features. And we're going to look for the multipath IO one. And make sure we check that box and hit next. And then go ahead and install that feature. All right, so now that that's completed successfully, we're going to go ahead and close this window. And then the next thing we need to do is configure the MPIO to allow support for iSCSI devices. So we'll pull up our start menu here and access the MPIO utility. And then we're going to go up to discover multipaths. And we want to make sure that we check that box to say add support for iSCSI devices and then click add. And uh, then it's going to require the server to be rebooted, which we're going to go ahead and do now. All right, so the server's been rebooted. We're back on the uh, test db one server. And now uh, basically nothing's changed at this point. We just added the uh, support for multipath IO. Um, but you'll notice if we look at the disk management, we still only see the one, one drive on the server, the OS drive, the one that was originally there. Um, but now is where we're going to go ahead and actually attach the iSCSI storage to the server. So the first thing we need to do is open up the iSCSI initiator. And uh, you'll notice that it says the service isn't running. Do we want to go ahead and start it and set it to start automatically with the server from now on? We're going to go ahead and click yes. All right, so that should take just a second to pop up here. And there we go. So notice under the discovered targets that there are no names listed or targets listed. So the first thing we want to do is click on the discovery tab at the top there and then click on the discover portal button. And for the IP address, we want to enter the IP address of our store one server, which is going to be 192.168.2.53. And we're going to leave the default port of 3260. So now if we go back to our targets tab here, you'll notice that our store one server is now listed under the targets. So if we go ahead and click on the connect button, so on the connect to target window, we want to make sure to check the enable multipath box and then click on the advanced button. And notice for the target portal IP, there's two IPs listed. This is because our storage server has those two NICs installed. So we're going to pick the first one, click OK, and then click OK again, and then click on our target and click on properties. 
and notice that there's one session already established. That's the one we just made. We're going to click on Add Session, and we want to make sure we enable Multipath again. Click on Advanced, and for the target portal IP, this time we're going to click the second IP address, the dot .54. And uh, this is what's going to enable our Multipath for the storage. And we're going to click OK, and then we're going to click OK to close out of the iSCSI initiator. All right, so with all that out of the way at this point, we should have our storage attached to the server. So if we open up our disk management, would you look at that? We have a one gig, a five gig, and additional five gig volumes all mounted to the server. So you have to keep in mind, uh, this is gonna be fresh storage. So you are gonna have to bring it online, initialize it, and uh, format it and all that fun stuff. So um, typically I bring everything on with GPT and uh, you know, if you're doing like SQL and any of that kind of stuff, you wanna make sure you format the 64K allocation units for your DB files and logs and all that fun stuff. Um, but it, you're just basically going to treat it like regular storage. So, like I said, you'll bring it online, you'll format it, you'll set your drive letters, you'll name the volumes, do all those kind of things. And then uh, whenever you're done, I'd go ahead and I take the volumes offline. And uh, that's when I'll go ahead and bring in my additional nodes at that point. Because, like I said, you don't want to have the volumes online by multiple nodes at one time. Whenever we get into the cluster portion, that'll handle all that for us. So, for now, I'll name them, format them, and then take them offline whenever I'm done. All right, so now that we configured our first host, we have to repeat these few simple steps on our additional host. So the first one's gonna be installing the MPIO feature, enabling that iSCSI support and rebooting the host. This is a very important step. If you do all the other steps correctly and you don't do this one, you end up seeing two sets of storage. So in this case where I added three volumes, you would actually end up seeing six volumes. So it's a very important step. Make sure you install that, enable the iSCSI support, and reboot the host. So step two is going to be opening the iSCSI initiator and making sure you click yes to set the service to auto and this also makes sure it starts for the first time. And in step three, configure the iSCSI storage via the iSCSI initiator tool, making sure that you enable the multipath and making sure to add that second session so that you enable the multipath IO. All right, so I went ahead and set up the TDBO2 server the same way that I set up the uh, O1, and I added the MPIO feature, I added the iSCSI support, and I configured the drives via the iSCSI initiator. So uh, looking at test DBO1, let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, disk management and just verify that all three volumes are still presented to the server. And uh, there we go. So we still see the 1 gig, the 5 gig, and the 5 gig. So let's go ahead and connect to the test DBO2 server and verify that we see all three volumes on that server as well. And we're going to expand the storage and look at the disk management. And there we go. We see all three volumes presented on this server as well. So now because both servers see all three volumes, we can go ahead and bring that storage into our Microsoft failover cluster. So we're going to go ahead and open up the cluster manager and click on disk on the left hand side. And then we click on add disk on the right hand side. And uh, there we go. We see our three uh, iSCSI volumes presented and we're just going to go ahead and click OK. And that's going to go ahead and bring the storage into our cluster. So what good is storage if we can't validate it? So the first thing we do is let's go up to the, uh, the cluster level here. And then we're going to click on validate cluster. And it takes a second for that to come up. All right, we're going to click next. And we're going to run only the test I select because in this case, we only want to test the storage because, hey, that's what we built up here. And, uh, and it takes forever to run this test anyway. So uh, like I said, we're gonna only going to check the storage option. We're going to click next. And we're going to check all three disks. So that's going to be our quorum, our DB files, and our DB logs. And we're going to click next. And then we're going to go ahead and click next. And it's going to go ahead and validate our storage. All right, so I don't know if you noticed, but it looks like we have 100% validated storage, which is actually presented from another Windows server to our cluster. So that's pretty much going to wrap this one up, guys. Um, like I said, I was really excited about this one. I feel like a lot of admins tend to get stuck whenever they get to clusters because they don't have that expensive SAN or DAS storage available to them. 
And um, this is a great way to get around that for your lab environment or whatever, you know, like whatever it takes to get you going, you know. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you click that like button. And if you really enjoyed the video, make sure you click that subscribe button. But as always, thanks for watching. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. And uh, it's the first one I turned out in a little bit, but I'm looking forward to making some more. Thanks for watching.